from the Holy One, and you know all things. Come to verse uh, uh, 27, uh, verse 28, uh, 26, I'll get it right in a minute. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, uh, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. Anybody in here saved by the grace of God that does not need a teacher? Put up your hand. Well, I need one. Well, then, you don't have an anointing from the Father that teaches you all things. That's obvious. But if I compare Ephesians chapter 4, he gave evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, so we need a teacher. But there's something about these people here the one that wrote the letter and so forth, as well as the others, that they don't need what we need today. Now, I would suggest to you, not tell you this is true, but I would suggest that it's about the 144,000 of Revelation chapter 7. We talked about it this morning. Uh... The book itself has 105 verses, and for whatever it's worth, the middle verse is chapter 3, and notice in verse 14. In chapter 3, verse 14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. How many of you people in this room can honestly say that you know that you pass from death in life because you love the brethren. Put up your hand. Hmm. Well, how many of you love your brother? <laughs> well, the book isn't written to the church which is the body of Christ. All of the Bible is for us, but it isn't all unto us. Now, this anointing is a very special thing. So I want you to go to chapter 4 now. And in chapter 4, I want you to read with me from verse... Uh, uh, well, let's start in verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. The implication in studying the book has to do with that these are tribulation saints. Over here, the second coming of Christ, atonement, is at the second coming over here. Now, they are looking for the atonement at the second coming, and therefore, notice 1 John, take 1 John 1 in one hand, and take Colossians chapter 2 in one hand. In Colossians chapter 2, notice in verse 13, And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. He said that you're to reckon yourself to be dead indeed unto sin. So we died when Christ died. Judicially, we died. We were buried when Christ was buried. We were quickened when Christ was quickened. Ephesians chapter 2 says that we were raised up together and made to sit together with him in heavenly places in Christ. Bless God, we are forgiven all trespasses, and that happened at Calvary. In fact, we were justified at Calvary. We were made righteous with the righteousness of God at Calvary. And if we are justified, righteous, and forgiven, God can't find any fault in you if you are a saved, Bible-believing saint of God. Amen. And that's a fact.
But these people over here, it's a different thing. In 1 John chapter 1, look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why is he saying that? Because their forgiveness is in the future. We look back to Calvary and have already received the atonement. Romans chapter 5 verse 11 says. These people are looking forward to atonement at the second coming. In Acts chapter 2, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sins. In other words, he knows that remission of sin for them is at the second coming, and he confirms it in chapter 3, verse 19. In chapter 3, verse 19, he said, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, and so forth and so on. So I know that the 3,000 and the 5,000 back here in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 were pitted and were baptized, identified with the Lord Jesus Christ in water baptism, looking for atonement, forgiveness, at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now back in the passage here, in First uh, uh, John chapter 4. In First John chapter 4, verse, eight, uh, verse 12. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected. Why is he saying that? Because during this period of time, there is going to be a man. This man is going to stand in the holy place in Jerusalem, and he's going to say, I am God. Worship me. And those who will not bow down to this man, the Antichrist, their heads will be cut off. And so the writer of this book is saying, God is an invisible God. In fact, when he wrote the book of John, he quotes Jesus Christ in John chapter 4, and the Bible says that Christ said, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In fact, when the tabernacle in the wilderness was set up, say that this right here represents the holy of holies, and there's a veil right across here. The glory of God came down inside the holy of holies back here. The glory of God that overshadowed Mary when she conceived a child called the Lord Jesus Christ. That glory of God is in that place back here. No visible individual, the glory of God. Moses didn't go on the mountain to talk to the Lord anymore. He came to the veil there and talked to the Lord, and the Lord spoke to him from behind the veil. That's a long time ago. So somebody is going to need some teaching. And so what is the book saying? The man that's going to stand in that holy place saying, I'm God is lying to you. God is invisible. No man has seen God at any time and so forth. Therefore, do not believe him. And yet thousands will. Now, back in the passage again. Verse 12. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Now, for the rest of my time here, I want to talk to you just a little bit about the word off. He has given us of his spirit. Turn to Acts chapter 2 and hold to the passage. In Acts chapter 2, now before I read, I want to mention to you, in fact, it would be better, I guess, if I go back a little further. Go back to chapter 1, and notice what the Lord told the apostles. 
in chapter 1, verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, You've heard of me. For John baptized with water, but you should be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Now go to verse 8. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, and so forth and so on. And the word witness there is from a Greek word that is spelled martyr. They're to be martyrs. And so they receive power so that they can do it. Now, but he told them you'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Notice in chapter 2, Peter is the preacher here, and he says in verse 29, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriot David, that he's both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. And on and on, come down to verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. Now, uh, so the big deal today is that the people in Acts chapter 2, 120 of them in people's eyes, received the Holy Spirit and they were filled with the Spirit Himself. In other words, they were full of the Holy Spirit. Somebody one time in an Assembly of God church said that the, wrong, that the thing that was wrong where that assembly was that some of them leaked. Well, I don't believe that you can have part of the Holy Spirit. I don't see any possibility of anybody ever at any time under any circumstances had part of the Holy Ghost. So that I would suggest there's something else going on here. Now, I must tell you, I must... The, the whole thing has to do with not that they are filled up with the Spirit that is full of the Spirit, but, the, but they receive off that which the Spirit has the power to give them. In other words, He is the giver that gives the gifts and to receive off the Spirit is to receive the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to the people that believe on Him. Now, hold on the passage and go back with me, please, to Genesis. I'm, I'm sorry, Exodus. In Exodus chapter 4, All right, in Exodus chapter 4, uh, verse 1. Now Moses is arguing with the Lord about going into Egypt to preach unto the Jews there. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, What is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, cast it on the ground, and he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand, and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand, that they may believe. In other words, why do this? That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob had appeared unto thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. 
And it came to pass, it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign, and it shall come to pass, if they will not believe these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that thou shalt take of the water of the river, and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood with the dry land. Now you couldn't miss that if you tried. How are they going to know that this man is sent from God? They're going to know that this man is sent from God because he performs miracles. Because of the things that he does, he'll have the power to do. Now turn with me please to 1 Corinthians and take 1 Corinthians chapter 1, holding on to Acts. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 with one hand and 1 Corinthians chapter 14 with the other. Or, or if you can handle them both with one hand, then do it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and we will just believe the Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22 For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Why did God Almighty give signs to Moses? Because the Jews require what? A sign. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 22 Wherefore tongues are for a sign, and on and on and on. Then tongues are a sign, and they're a sign to who? Why? The Jews require a sign. And so God gave signs. Now, the Lord has trained 12 men back here. They're called kings, and they're called priests. And you sh he said, you shall reign on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. <coughs> These men back here are going to be preaching in the tribulation. Matthew chapter 24 said, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, beginning in Jerusalem. And he said, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation that Daniel described, stand in the holy place, run for your lives. So I know then that the twelve expected to be in the tribulation. These twelve, to prove who they are and what they are, as well as the 144,000, have to have signs. Why? Because the Jews require a sign. How about Greeks? They seek after wisdom. Now, back in Acts again. In Acts chapter 2, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it, the sound, not wind, the sound, it filled all the house where they were sitting. Years ago, I heard Oral Roberts, and there was a man at that time that helped him and whatever, and I'm not positive about his name. I think he called him Dewees. And he said, I'm in Jerusalem. Yesterday, he said, Brother Dewees and I were in the upper room and we were praying. And suddenly, the mighty wind began to blow in there. And he went on and on uh, of what he was saying. And he was lying. How do I know he was lying? In A.D. 70, Jerusalem was plowed under. Jerusalem was flattened out and plowed under, and there weren't no upper room when he was there. But that isn't all. The Bible didn't say there was a strong wind blowing in that room. It said there was a sound as of a wind. Now, when the and people call it the Shekinah glory. I don't believe those that use that word know what it means anyway. So when the glory of God came into that tabernacle there, and remember that the Lord said in John 3, the wind blow it where it listed. You can hear the sound thereof. You can't tell where it came from, nor where it's going, so forth and so on. So when the Holy Spirit 
when God, who is a spirit, the glory of God, when that came down in that temple there, it's like a wind in there, and yet no curtains are blowing around, but it's in there. He is there, and Moses talked to him from there. Now back in the passage. In verse uh, 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind. And it, the sound, it, filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as of fire. It didn't say fire sat upon them. It said cloven tongues, like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. In other words, the Holy Ghost is the filler. The Holy Ghost fill them with something. The Holy Ghost fill them with power, Acts chapter 1, verse 8 said. And so, ignorant fishermen, ignorant men who didn't have an education or whatever, spoke in the language of people that they didn't even know themselves. I'm going to say that this right here represents the Mediterranean Sea, the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea, uh, an imaginary line down there. Down here is Judah, up there is Israel. Ten tribes up there, two down here. In the 7th century B.C., Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, carried the ten tribes captive into the world. They came back every year to Jerusalem, at the time of Pentecost. They're there for this Jewish feast day of Leviticus 23, Acts chapter 2. And while they're there, this thing happened. These men had 700 years to lose the ability to speak in Hebrew and, and uh, uh, as Jews spoke. In other words, there were many of them that were Jews by nature that were raised in foreign countries and would have spoken as a Jew in America today, an American Jew, speak English and might not even know Hebrew. And so when they got back there to that feast day, on this particular feast day, the Holy Ghost gave these men the power to talk in the language of those people from which they came. And so they spoke in the language of the people and magnified the Lord, glorified the Lord, and so forth. It has nothing to do with, as people make up, that they spoke in Greek and the people heard them in their own tongue. That's not the way it was. They spoke in the language. They had the power to do it. They had the authority and ability to do it. It is a gift from God to them because the Jews require a sign. Greeks seek after wisdom. Now, over and over you find this. Now, notice something. Verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, you men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, and that always fascinated me. Go back, to, go back there and notice what they did. Uh, verse 12, They were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. And so people like Dr. Ruckman down in Pensacola, Florida, I mean, they got this thing about wine, you know, and uh, the Lord's Supper and so forth, and they say it's grape juice. Okay. I mean, here's Peter saying, or somebody, saying the problem with these people, they've been drinking that old grape juice all day long, <laughs> and it has affected their speech. <laughs> no. He said these... They said, these men are full of new wine. Now, I'll tell you what you do. <clears throat> if you ever get to wherever he is at that point, and you run into Noah, ask him about new wine. <laughs> I'll guarantee you he can tell you. He drank it and didn't even know he was drinking it, evidently. I imagine he went out to the vineyard and got some grapes and squeezed them and tasted it. Wow! 
hey, that's different. I believe I'll have some more. And the first thing you know, old Noah is drunk. <coughs> Off of what? New wine. Where did it come from? Well, the Bible says the new wine comes from the cluster. Grapes can ferment on the vine. Fermented grapes, fermented on the vine is called new wine. Now, back in the passage. Verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea, all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known to you, hearken to my words. These are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it's but the third hour of the day. Uh, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Verse 18, On my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit. You know what? He is not saying, and by the way, Peter is not quoting Joel. The power of the Holy Spirit caused Peter to put the word ah in there that Joel didn't have in there. Joel said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Over here. Back here, he poured out up, not part of. He poured unto them the power of the Holy Spirit, the power by the Holy Spirit, so that they could do things that made them be a sign unto the Jews because the Jews require a sign. Greeks seek after wisdom. It has nothing to do with getting part of the Spirit and being filled up inside with a portion of the Spirit and then it all leaves somehow and you have to go back to the altar and repent and confess your sins and get slain in the Spirit and then get baptized with the Spirit and then get full of it all over again and on and on and do it over and over. That is not Bible. In fact, the beginning of the tongues movement in America was in California about the turn of the century and it began with a ministry of a woman. She was having a woman's Bible class and got them started in the speaking of yabba dabba do something or other. <laughs> Concibity eye, possum up a gun spout. Hondo, Toyota, I don't know why. But folks, it ain't for real. They may have the ability and power by a spirit to speak, but it ain't the Holy Spirit. I have some friends that live in Birmingham, and if I were to call the name, a lot of you in here would know them. They have a relative that had a friend that went to college with her from a foreign country, an Asian. And they were in a Pentecostal meeting one night. And people in there were doing what they call speaking in tongues. And the little girl got up. She started crying. She got up and ran out of the building. It's not a phony tale now. They went out. They were very shocked. They wondered what in the world is wrong with this girl. And she said that they are using extremely filthy language in there. She said what they're doing in there is forbidden in my country where we come from. <coughs> Folks, I don't know who I'm talking to tonight. There, I mean, I know, I see your faces out there. I don't know where you've been or what you were doing while you were there. But I can tell you this. The Bible says in Proverbs 
that if you do not have control over your spirit or an individual who does not have control over their spirit is like a city with the walls broken down. In other words, the enemy can come in and take anything they want. They can do anything they want if the walls aren't there. Don't fool around with this. A man in Atmore, Alabama, a friend of ours, uh, his wife, he, by the way, he was a pastor of an independent Baptist church. A Pentecostal tent meeting was going on. His wife was persuaded to go. A friend that persuaded her, persuaded her also that she needed to go to the altar and pray. She said, I don't need that. The wife finally said, I don't see why you think it would hurt. It won't hurt to pray, will it? No. Well, then why not come down there and do it and kept on until the woman did it. Later, she got, as they say, slain in the spirit and spoke in tongues. She did away with all her jewelry, rings and everything, all her short sleeve dresses. And back then, we're talking 35 years ago or more, and it was different back there than it is right now. You know, it's funny how the devil works, isn't it? I mean, there was a time back there that Pentecostalists uh, wore their hair down their back back there because it would be a sin for them to cut it off. And then the hippie movement came along, and it just turned everything bottom side up. You know, like Bernice and I, when we lived in Mobile about 103 years ago, <laughs> Uh, back then, we were in a member of we were members of an independent Baptist church, and they believed that it was a sin to buy groceries in a store that sold beer. So we wouldn't go to a store that sold beer and buy groceries. And the devil said, ha, 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 "Watch this!" And he just picked it so that all the grocery stores started selling beer. And now these dedicated people of God go in there and buy. Come on, come on folks. God, ha uh, the devil, the God of this world, has a way of making people look silly. This thing we're reading about here, the gifts are referred to by Paul. Paul said, I speak with tongues more than you all. Now notice in, fir in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. He said, You know that you were Gentiles, carried away under these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given unto every man to profit with all. To one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, and on and on and on. These are gifts. During that period of time back there when Paul was going to the Jews, going into the synagogues and whatever, during that time there were the speaking with tongues, languages of the people, to manifest the fact that they were of God. Today, Paul didn't do it anymore. He didn't perform the miracles anymore. He told Timothy, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. You know that always just really at me. I got to thinking about that thing, and I thought, isn't that weird? After all those years of preaching, there's the Apostle Paul establishing churches and all these churches that he established. Are you telling me that there wasn't one man out of all of that that had the power to lay hands on Paul and heal him? Paul had a doctor go with him unto his death. Isn't that a rip? You mean to tell me that the Holy Ghost just leapfrogged over the whole thing and came over here and landed on the Robertses and the Orals and the 
Benny Hens and the whatchamacallits, and all that time they uh, come on, kid. Let's not fool around this thing. Somebody's pulling somebody's leg. <laughs> now, turn with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians 5, notice something. Let's start in verse uh, 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, uh, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine, where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks, and so forth. Now, be filled with the Spirit. Not that the Holy Spirit is filling them up with Himself, but He is the filler. Not that He is giving them the gifts of tongues and healing and whatever, but look at the parallel passage in Colossians 3. In Colossians 3, uh, verse... Uh, Let's start in verse, um, let's see, 15. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be you thankful. Now watch, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Go back to Ephesians 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse uh, 18, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in the heart of the Lord. Go back to Colossians again. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, and hymns and spirit. Why, well, you know something? What will the Holy Spirit fill you with? He'll fill you with the Word of God. Why? Because you cannot manifest the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and what He accomplished at Calvary except by the Bible. You say, but you can too. They could do it by the Holy Spirit. You've got to be kidding me. You ever talk to one? that had been slain in the Spirit and had the baptism of the Holy Ghost and on and on, I have. For instance, a man was in my home as an insurance salesperson. I knew the man, been knowing him for a long time. Had his briefcase all laid out there and everything and I was witnessing to him. And he's telling me about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and this and that and the other and I'm talking to him about the Bible and on and on and finally he said, Brother Moore, you know that I can't contend with you about the Bible. You know that I don't know the Bible like you. And I said, hold it. Time out. Are you telling me that you've been slain in the Spirit, had the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and you can speak in other languages and so forth, and yet you don't know the Bible? And I've never been slain in the Spirit. I've never had the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I know bi more Bible than you do. And that fellow just folded up his briefcase and out the door he went. A man and I, a pastor and I, was in a church, I, I'm sorry, was in a house in Mobile, Alabama, and the woman in there was a Pentecostal pastor. So I had my Bible on the coffee table there, and she was on the other side, and I was trying to show her that, and she was shutting my Bible. And I said, please don't do that. Look at the verses. I don't need to look at verses. And so we started, and she shut the Bible. And I said, you got something, and whatever. Anyway, she jumped up, and that woman started screaming, the devil's in my house, the devil's come in here, and she's running around in there and acting like some kind of crazy thing, and she ran out on the sidewalk, and she's yelling that there are two demons in my house here, and, and people are coming out their doors, and, they, and me and this guy got to leave, 
<laughs> and all these people are looking all around at us. And I hope I didn't step on somebody's guitar up there. And uh, I mean, come on, folks. This stuff is ridiculous. You know that? <laughs> the Bible is the Word of God. Holy men of God wrote as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I've got the words of the Holy Ghost in a book. If I want these words, I have to get in this book and read them and study them, and they can be in my heart, and I can quote them, and I can say them, and on and on and on. But I can't do it unless I read them and memorize this book. <coughs> but they didn't have the completed Word of God in Acts 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so forth and so on, and so one day they got it. Turn back to to 1 Corinthians 13 and then I'm going to shut up. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 I'm going to start in verse 1. Just hang in there with me now. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith I could remove mountains and have not charity I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, worketh, uh, seeketh not our own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Do you?